What's up guys and welcome back to Moan Inc. If you guys are new here then what is up? My name is Erica. Hey, how you doing? And if you're into the history of the ancient Greeks and the Romans, maybe you're just into the mythology and maybe, maybe you're just here to hear about book 19 of Homer's Iliad. This is not only the channel for you, this is also the video specifically for you. You guys are going to want to hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so you know every single time I post in the future. But as I have already spoiled from that intro, we're going to be going into book 19 of Homer's Iliad today. So let's just roll into that. If I could summarize book 19 into one sentence, it would be that Achilles and Agamemnon finally make up, which thank God it has been long enough. Like literally the argument was book one people. And they are still arguing after attempts of speaking to Achilles and it not working. We're now finally 19 chapters in and it's finally happened. So thank goodness at least we now have some movement in this chapter. On the plus side as well, I know that these videos always tend to be really long. The chapter is pretty short because it's just a little conversation to set up for the rest of the book. So let's just, I'm just gonna start describing it now because otherwise we'll be here for a really long time. So let's just, let's just do it. So in the last book, I left you with Thetis running down with the armor to go to Achilles to be like, hello, now you can go out into battle because we made some armor for you from Hephaestus. Oh, it's so nice. So that is where we left you. And this is exactly where we're picking up. So she now makes it down to Achilles who is literally still crying over the body of Patroclus. Hello, sad, as expected. Like literally Achilles is still weeping. And so Thetis goes over to him and like grabs his hands and it's like look honey you kind of have to accept he's gone now this is, <laughs> this is it Patrick was is now a body however along with that um I have this really nice gift for you and so she then pulls up the armor Achilles picks it up he's still like weeping and he's like trying to wipe his eyes and he's like okay mom what and he looks at this armor and he's just like all right this armor is hot as hell super excited to get it on there's no doubt it was made by a god like a mortal could not have crafted this amazing Thing. But he does voice to his mother that he's worried if he leaves Patroclus's body that then flies and worms and all this sort of stuff will get to it and will sort of like disturb the flesh. So he expresses that worry and Thetis is just like, honey, I got you. So she tells him to call a meeting to talk to the other Greeks about going back into battle and all of this and she will handle the body and Achilles just kind of like nods and he's like, okay, mom. And what she does is she like plugs his nose with ambrosia and nectar so that, that way the, the skin on the outside doesn't get tarnished. I don't know how that, that works. Again, I don't know the science behind any of the things that Homer says. I don't know if there is science behind any of the things that Homer says. But anyways, that is her method and surprisingly it works. So Achilles walks along the beach and he just starts screaming basically. He starts rousing everybody up for this meeting and he's like, I'm calling an assembly! And everybody just like goes to gather for the assembly, even the injured heroes. So we have Diomedes and Odysseus who show up literally leaning on their spears because they're still injured, obviously, right? They're injured for the second half of the book, which is why Achilles has to come back. Anyways, they come in and even Agamemnon, obviously he's like the main, the main reason of why they're calling the assembly because Achilles is like, I have to apologize to Agamemnon. I have to, to bury the hatchet and basically be able to move past this. And so he then calls Agamemnon. Agamemnon shows up because we are also reminded that he's injured because Koan, if we remember that from when that happened, Koan stabbed him. So he shows up though, all of the heroes show up for Achilles to basically apologize and then to announce that he's coming back into battle. When everyone gets settled in this assembly place, right, Achilles stands up and he's like, all right guys, I need to talk directly to Agamemnon in front of all of you. And Agamemnon, let's start with just saying that we fought over a girl that we should have never fought and it's all her fault. And I wish that Artemis would have killed her with an arrow and blah, 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 because otherwise none of this would have ever happened. And most of the Greeks wouldn't have lost so many lives. And you're just reading it like, what? It's really upsetting because Achilles, you guys know that I have, I struggle with Achilles because he has moments of being really, really great and being this like fantastic hero where you're like, yes, Achilles, do your thing. I'm so ready. And even in book one, I did say a lot of praise for him where I was like, he wasn't the problem in the beginning. It was Agamemnon that was the problem. However, we get to this point and you're just like, hold up. Hold up, have we all just read the same story? This was not Briseis' fault, and yet Achilles is such a child in this moment. Like, Agamemnon has already said his part, if we remember, that Agamemnon had sent an assembly to Achilles when he was in the tent to apologize, to say, this is my fault, this is what I take responsibility for, this is now Achilles' time to take responsibility, and he's saying, no, it's Briseis' fault, and I'm like, Oh, he does then even say this really funny thing where he's just like, oh, because of this argument caused by this girl, 
that the rest of time people will remember this argument forever. Everyone's going to remember that we had this thing and you're reading it like, lol, little does he know that this is the most, one of the most famous arguments in all of ancient Greece. Definitely on par with the argument that Medea and Jason had. Definitely in the same realm. But anyways, he does end with saying that he wants to go back into battle and he wants everybody to get ready for battle. And so all the Greeks are like super happy to hear this. Agamemnon then gets up to speak in response and he basically says that there was nothing else that he could have done apart from take Achilles' girl given the situation that was at hand. And instead of him taking the responsibility that he did initially, he won't do that to Achilles' face and in front of the entire assembly, obviously, because it's Agamemnon. So instead, he says that it's all delusion's fault, and he says, all of us were, were a victim of delusion, including Zeus himself. Delusion is Zeus's eldest daughter, mind you. And so he's just like, oh no, it's all her fault. And if it wasn't for her, then we wouldn't have had this argument. And again, you're reading it like, what? This was all because both of you are children. But obviously, once again, they can't take accountability for sh but Agamemnon does offer Achilles all of the gifts that he once did offer Achilles. I mean, actually slightly less. I do have a list for when those come up because I absolutely cannot remember those. But he does say that he still has the gifts for Achilles and he will uh, bring them to him by the ships or wherever he wants them. Achilles then says, okay, that's great. If you really want to give me the gifts, then that's fine. But like, I don't really need them to be quite honest. If you want to give them to me, fine. But we should really go into war first. We should go into battle. We should, we should basically beat the shit out of the Trojans and then come back and handle all of that stuff. But Odysseus hears this and Odysseus is like, well, Achilles, you can't tell all of these men who are starving to go back into battle. Like, this is ridiculous. First of all, feed your men, and then we'll discuss fighting. He then also suggests on the end of this that actually Agamemnon should bring all the gifts to the middle of the assembly as a way to sort of appease Achilles. And also what he should do there is he should swear an oath that he'd never touch Briseis. Because obviously Briseis is one of the gifts, right? Because she's the, apparently the cause of this whole argument. <laughs> But so he says, you know, Agamemnon should swear this as well. So that way you have like all the respect from the men and, and all of this sort of jazz. Agamemnon actually is pretty happy with this, to be quite honest. He's just like, you know what? I'm totally down for that, Odysseus. I'm gonna send you and a bunch of your men of your choosing, whoever you want to bring, to go and get the gifts and to bring them back. Because in the meantime, I'll have Talthybius. If you don't remember who Talthybius is, that is like his little henchman. And he's like, I'll have Talthybius basically get this boar ready to sacrifice for like the oath and all of this sort of jazz. So we'll have that happening whilst you go and get the gifts and bring them here. Achilles then pipes up again and he's just like, okay guys, yeah, with the whole gift thing, later, we need to fight first. If you guys want to eat, I don't really give a shit because I'm not eating. His thing is that he doesn't want to eat because he feels so sad about Patroclus. So food is not the first thing on his mind. So he does sort of project that onto the rest of the men, these like big hungry Greek men. He's like, no, we're all in mourning, so you can't eat. Whereas obviously they're all like starving and they're not Achilles. They're not a son of God. So they're just like, mm, food please. Odysseus then is like Achilles. Once again, I'm older. I know more than you. The men have to eat. This is ridiculous. If you haven't realized this is the main conversation in this whole book, everybody's saying no food. Food, no food, food. So Odysseus again is like, food first. Let me go and get the gifts. So he actually brings Meges, Meriones. I think those are the two main characters that he brings with them. And then like three other characters that he brings with them to go and pick up all of these gifts. Now the gifts, let me just read off the list that I have on my little, little post in because I cannot remember all of these numbers. So the list of things, where are they? Oh, by the way, Thoas is another one that he brings. Totally forgot that, but I do have a, a note that Thoas is brought. So the gifts include seven tripods, 12 shining cauldrons, 12 horses, seven women, the eighth of which is obviously Perseus, but seven other women for Achilles. I lost my place. Oh, and then, and then 10 talents of gold. So those are the gifts that they all have to bring back. They kind of remind me of like the wise men in this moment, because all of them must be holding something separate because there wasn't that many things that, you know, they're all sort of just like, hello, here you go, here are all the gifts. Meanwhile, we have Talphibius who does sacrifice that ball, right? So that Agamemnon can make the whole oath thing. And he does make the oath. He's like, oh, I swear to God that I never swear to a God, not to like God in general. He's like, I swear to the gods that I did not sleep with Briseis, which I must say, I just, don't believe. And I know that after this, all the classes who are watching this being like, well, after this, he does say that if he was to falsely make this oath, that then a God should punish him and like make sure that he's like publicly embarrassed and all of this. Yes, okay, I did read that part too. Don't worry, I did translate that part. However, you're telling me that this is the second slave woman that Agamemnon has had all to himself in his tent and he's not slept with them? That just does not, I don't believe that. I don't believe that for a second. He claims he didn't sleep with Chryseis and then he claims he didn't sleep with Briseis. And I'm like, so what were you doing? Just like having tea with her in the tent? Like, honey, Honey, I don't believe you. Anyways, Achilles then says, 
thank you. And he also reiterates once again that it was Delusion who did all of this to make them argue anyway. So he's just like, it's fine, I'll take Briseis back because it's not really your fault, it's also Delusion's fault. And because this was the work of a god, it must mean that it was for a reason. And again, there's something stupid that Achilles says because you're like, okay, so it had nothing to do with the fact that both of you are children. It's all Delusion's fault, it's all a woman's fault. Wait, what? I just, I really can't with these characters sometimes. Anyways though, Achilles then demands that the whole meeting breaks up after this whole display. And so everybody goes back to their ships, including Achilles. He brings back all of the gifts back to his ships and everything, including Briseis. Now this is the first time that Briseis has seen Patroclus dead. Okay, so this is like, another really sad moment. I'm not in black today because we're not really in mourning once again. We're used to Patroclus being dead. This is just the first time that Briseis has seen this whole thing. So when she arrives, she is described as being like a golden Aphrodite and she just breaks down, does the typical lamenting thing when she sees Patroclus' body. She's like beating her breast, pulling out her hair, the whole lot. The other women who came with her, they also lament. Once again, so as I was saying with the Achilles thing, this is a normal reaction for women. So Briseis doing this, not a big deal. It was when Achilles did this, big deal. But Briseis actually says some really interesting things in this moment, right? So she tells us that actually Patroclus was the really nice one of the pair. That when her family were being killed by Achilles, like in front of her, it was Patroclus who was the one that brought her kindly back to the ships. He was the one that wouldn't let her feel any sorrow. He was the one that was really there for her. And in fact, when she got then scared, when she came back to the, the camps and all of this, it was Patroclus that promised her that he was gonna get Achilles to marry her so that she would be safe in Pythia. Bithia? How will we say where Achilles is from? So we actually see this really nice soft side of Patroclus through what Briseis tells us. And everybody weeps and Achilles is still upset. So all of these like big heroes go with Achilles back to his tent. So we've got like Menelaus and, and all of these sorts of people, Odysseus, Agamemnon, Nestor, Phoenix, all of these sorts of people. And they all go back to the ships and Achilles still refuses to eat. And he says that he will not eat possibly until the evening. He's like, I can see the food. I know it's an option, but I'm choosing, I'm actively choosing not to in my pain. And again, we have another sad line from Achilles where he says that this pain that he's feeling, that Patroclus dying is worse than if he found out if his dad died. Like remember that that was one of his fears when Patroclus had come back initially to talk to him about what was happening with between the, the Trojans and the Greeks on the battlefield, that that was the main fear of his, that his dad had died. And he now tells us that Patroclus dying is way worse than that, which again is why lots of people think that there was more than just a friendship between the two of them because Achilles, his grief is heavy. He also says that it's really sad because Patroclus has said that he would bring Achilles' son back to Pythia, Pythia wherever, from Skyros, where he, he actually grew up. So Neoptolemus, he was gonna bring him back and show him all of his possessions and all of this. So Patroclus had this whole future planned with Achilles as well. Like we need to bear that in mind. And that is also what Achilles is mourning in this moment. He's not only mourning the present Patroclus, he's also mourning the possibility of having that future Patroclus that he now doesn't get. So he mourns, he mourns some more. And he says that, you know, like now Peleus is gonna have to deal with me dying. His dad, by the way, if you didn't know who Peleus was. So he then like stresses that again and all of this. And as he's mourning, then we cut to Zeus and Athena and Zeus just looks at Athena and is like, um, excuse me, don't you give a f about Achilles anymore? Like why are you, why are you just letting him be miserable like this? So Zeus orders Athena to go down to Achilles and to make sure that he doesn't feel the like pain of his hunger because he's about to be stuck. Like, I mean, he's starving anyways, but he's about to go into that phase of just like, I could eat a horse. So Athena is encouraged to go down. She instills, um, instills or distilled? Ooh, what was the actual word used in translation? I think it was distilled, but I'm not really sure. Either way, she puts um, this, this feeling basically in him so that he doesn't feel the hunger. He doesn't feel the pain of hunger. Uh, and she uses ambrosia and nectar to do that. So she like infuses him with her godly magic in order to do this so that that way he can go on into battle. And he's not affected by the fact that he is choosing to starve himself. She does this in the form of a hawk and then she flies straight back to Zeus. So Achilles doesn't even know that she's done this. And then Achilles puts on all of his armor to then go out into battle. And this is the moment where mythology gets a little carried away, right? Because Achilles gets into his little chariot and he starts talking to his horses. And he's just like, hey guys, we're gonna go out into battle. And I need you to make sure that your charioteer definitely comes back from this battle, okay? We don't wanna have a whole repeat of the Patroclus situation. You don't wanna leave the body out there. Just make sure that the charioteer comes back to the Greek camps. And the reason why mythology gets a little carried away right now is because the horses reply. <laughs> the horses literally all of a sudden have a voice and they're just like, don't worry, boo, but <laughs> make sure that you come back to the Greek camps. But they also prophesize his death. The horses, I wanna just make that really clear, that the horses are speaking 
to Achilles. Okay, to be fair, the gods did infuse them with this voice and Homer does tell us like the gods let them speak. However, it's just like, just that one step further where you're like, okay, well the rest of the story was fine. And then all of a sudden the horses started speaking. It gets weirder, mind you, in the, in the following books, more weird things start speaking, but <laughs> the horses do this. And Achilles is not shocked that the horses are speaking to him. That's my favorite part. That he just goes, why are you speaking about my death right now? Like, that's absolutely not what we need. I need you to bring me out into battle and then just bring me back. Let's not talk about my death, okay? And then the horses are like, sick. And then they, they go off into into battle. But that's the end of book 19. It ends on a really weird note, but it does set the tone for the rest of the book. So now we know the ending once again. Remember throughout this entire book, we have been told from various characters, like we know that once Patroclus dies, Achilles is gonna come out and he's gonna kill Hector. So that is what we're gearing up for. If you've been enjoying this series, if you enjoyed this episode, then please hit that like button so that I know. And um, yeah, we'll be seeing you guys next time for book 20 of Homer's Iliad. We'll see you guys then.